In my last Splatoon history video, we talked about the Dynamo Roller, a weapon that was once insanely powerful, but after it was nerfed, never got anywhere close to what it once was. Splatoon has many weapons that rise to the top and fall back down, and many of those weapons often never see the top spot again. Well, what about a weapon that did get to see the top spot again, after having one of the highest peaks anything in this game had ever had? This is the Mini Splatling, a weapon that is relatively forgotten about today, but has stood as meta-defining not once, but twice. It managed to work its way into the top in completely different games for completely different reasons, which is an extremely rare feat, something only a select few weapons have ever done before. Well, how did this happen? Were the conditions just right for it to work, or was it always good and just slept on until people discovered its power? This is the history of the Mini Splatling. In order to understand this weapon's history, we need to go over what the weapon actually is. The Mini Splatling is part of the Splatling weapon class, defined by their main mechanic, which is charging up their shots in order to fire. Upon releasing their charge, the Splatlings fire a barrage of shots at a very high rate. This charging mechanic is the main turnoff for most people looking to pick up Splatlings, so in exchange, all Splatlings have above average range and at least good paint, as well as having more specific and unique strengths than the class with the most similarities to the Splatlings shooters. These bonuses often make the Splatlings very strong main weapons, as most of the unique strengths that they get are really good. Some examples of these strengths being Nautilus's ability to hold its charge while swimming in ink, ball points to firing modes, and Hydra's super long range 3 shot after getting a full charge. Mini Splatling's unique strength is its insanely good mobility, having the fastest strafe speed of the Splatlings at 0.86, and the second fastest movement speed while charging of the Splatlings at 0.72, second only to ball point. On top of this, it has a 2 ring charge which consumes 17.25% of your tank, and finishes charging much faster than any other Splatling filling the first ring in around 20 frames and the second ring 10 frames later, equaling 30 frames or half a second for a full charge. This frame data gives Mini the best mobility and speed of the Splatlings, and while this mobility is enough to make it a strong weapon already, there's much more to the Mini than just that. Mini is known for its mobility, obviously, but there are three other major strengths of this weapon that are much less talked about, the first of which being its seemingly unremarkable range value. When looking at the weapon alone, its range may seem really lacking, especially when compared with the rest of its weapon class. But when you take this weapon and put it up against some of the really good shooters, such as the Splattershot, 52 Gal, NZAP, and the splash o -Matic, of which at least one of these have always been very good at any given point in time, you'll see that Mini outranges all of them by a significant margin. This means Mini's matchup spread is actually really good, like the rest of the Splatlings, and it often has some of the best spreads in any point in the game's meta something that often doesn't get talked about because Nautilus, a much more popular and commonly used Splatling, has an even better matchup spread ranked alongside some of the best main weapons in the game, like Tenebrella and Squeezer. On top of its mobility and its great matchups, this thing also has crazy paint and special output, being so good that it's even considered to be among the best painters in the entire game. Mini Splatling is the most comparable Splatling to the short-range shooters, but it outpaints almost all of them by a lot, and gets its special up much more often as well, as long as you're playing for it. These four main strengths open up the window for Mini Splatling to play into its ideal flexible playstyle. It can play aggressively with its mobility and its matchup confidence, but this mobility, along with its paint and special outputs, also gives it the power to directly aid its teammates in fights, or orient its playstyle around its special, allowing it to work more supportively as well. Weapon kits, of course, are a large factor in whether or not it can truly play this way and still be impactful, but the great strengths of the main weapon certainly play a large role in its ideal functionality and place on a team. Speaking of weapon kits, the usage of Mini Splatling is very dependent on its kit, which can be both a big weakness and a big strength. I won't go into specifics on weapon kits just yet, as that's a large portion of these videos already, but a big part of Mini's legacy in these games is decided by whether its kit works with it or not. Mini is a great weapon, don't get me wrong, but if it gets an unfavorable kit, it really won't stand out over the weapons that can do similar things to it. For example, Mini Splatling only really works with three sub-weapons in the game, and all of the others are generally unfavored. Shooters, on the other hand, which Mini functions pretty similarly to as I mentioned before, can work with almost any sub-weapon as they don't have Mini's limitations, like needing to have enough ink for a charge. This means that if a Mini Splatling kit gets a sub-weapon it really likes, there's a very high likelihood that the other Mini Splatling kits without that sub-weapon will just be worse by default. On top of this, if a shooter gets a similar kit to a Mini Splatling, and the weapons want to function in similar ways, players will often gravitate towards that shooter due to the lower barrier of entry and generally higher skill ceiling, as well as less obvious weaknesses in the main weapon. Mini Splatling, as well as every other Splatling besides Nautilus, share one very large weakness, being their heavy reliance on a certain gear ability, run speed up. 
Since you lose your charge when you go into squid form and you need to charge in order to fire, being in kid form is the best for the splatlings, so increasing their run speed is vital for the splatling playstyle, meaning that you have to run a lot of run speed up. On mini splatling, it seems like the minimum you should be using is 26 AP run speed up, or 2 mains and 2 subs. Of course, that is the considered minimum, and most players run more than that just because of how important run speed up is, but this does unfortunately take up space that could be spent on valuable abilities, such as special charge up or special power up, and especially takes away the freedom to run as many main exclusive abilities like last ditch effort and stealth jump. Alongside run speed up, mini splatling builds often run more than just one sub of ink resistance up. They do this because mini paints its feet while firing relatively infrequently, so more freedom to touch enemy ink is really nice for it. It's also worth noting that while Nautilus and Ballpoint are rechargeable while firing, which looks like this, Mini and the other two Splatlings are not able to do this, limiting their mobility and movement freedom a little bit, but overall not too much. Without the limitations of gear reliance and kit dependency, Mini would probably be severely overpowered, and these aspects that hold it back keep the weapon in a pretty balanced state, which is good. Despite these limitations though, Mini Splatling is still really strong, and has managed to hold the status of meta defining twice throughout the Splatoon games. To understand why this is, we need to go where it all started, the first game, Splatoon 1. Now here's where the pacing of this video gets kinda weird. Mini Splatling in Splatoon 1 receives three kits, being the Vanilla Mini Splatling, the Zinc Mini Splatling, and the Refurbished Mini Splatling. Basically, the Vanilla and Refurbished kits are significantly less important and less used than the Zinc kit, so I'm gonna get those two out of the way first and then talk about the Zinc Mini. Just stick with me, I promise it'll make sense. Splatoon 1's Vanilla Mini Splatling comes with Suction Bomb and a Light Depletion Ink Zuka, which at first glance sounds like, and is, a really good kit. Suction Bomb has always been great, as it threatens a pretty large area for a good amount of time before it explodes, allowing the mini to capitalize off this area denial, as well as get faster kills if someone is chipped by the Suction Bomb. Combine this with Ink Zuka, a very strong special which can threaten enemies from across most maps, and you get a pretty solid weapon. This kit really isn't bad at all, and the only thing truly holding it back is Suction Bomb, since it takes 70% of your tank to use, giving mini significantly longer downtime to deal with as opposed to a cheaper sub like Burst Bomb. If you take this weapon out of the vacuum that we've been looking at it in though, it's clear to see why it's not considered to be very good. This is the Tentatech Splattershot, a very similar weapon with the exact same kit of Suction Bomb and Ink Zuka, and it absolutely outclasses the Mini. Even though T-Tech has heavy depletion whereas Mini has light depletion, T-Tech is much better than the Mini Splatling for two main reasons, which also happen to be Mini Splatling's two biggest weaknesses, being kit reliance and gear dependency. As I mentioned before, Mini doesn't necessarily like Suction Bomb because it takes up 70% of your tank to throw, meaning Mini Splatling can only get two full charges with the rest of its tank. Shooters, in this case, the Splattershot, don't have to charge their shots, so they aren't nearly as limited by ink usage, making the Splattershot perform better with Suction Bomb than the Mini Splatling. On top of this, Mini is very gear dependent as we mentioned before, and Splatoon 1 happens to be the game where gear matters the most often deciding if a weapon is viable or not entirely based on what gear it can run effectively. In the two gear-dependent metas of Splatoon 1, being the damage up, defense up era and the quick respawn stealth jump era, Mini's heavy reliance on run speed up means it struggles to run these gear abilities effectively, whereas T-Tech can run whatever it wants, significantly bumping T-Tech up the tier list and Mini down. Skipping over the second kit for now, we have kit number three, the refurbished Mini Splatling, equipped with Burst Bomb and a Light Depletion Burst Bomb Rush. While not being too good, this kit is actually pretty important for the future of the Mini Splatling, as it introduced Mini's favorite sub-weapon onto its kit lineup. Burst Bomb is a great sub for Mini Splatling, just like most weapons in the game, as it really enhances Mini's already great mobility, as well as allowing it to chip or quickly finish off opponents it couldn't fully kill with its shorter than usual firing time. Burst Bomb Rush, on the other hand, isn't exactly great for the weapon. Not only is it worse because bomb rushes don't have extended range like Splatoon 2 bomb launchers do, meaning the use for burst bomb rush is extremely limited in the first place, but it doesn't synergize very well with the mini splatling. Mini wants to use its main weapon, and encouraging it to throw burst bombs to attack in a game where opponents could be running defense up and it would take even longer to kill is generally not great. Just having burst bomb on their kit is really nice, but burst bomb rush was a bit too much. On top of this, thanks to bomb rushes not having the same attributes as bomb launchers, like I mentioned before, Burst Bomb Rush is one of the worst specials in the game, and oftentimes, running it felt like a waste of a special. Considering there were only two weapons in the game with Burst Bomb Rush, and they were both pretty bad, it often felt like a waste of a weapon slot, too. 
Even with this enhanced mobility from Burst Bomb, Mini still relies a lot on run speed up, again being the main factor as to why the refurbished and vanilla Mini Splatlings struggled in the landscape of Splatoon 1. Still, this kit made people realize the synergy that Mini had with Burst Bomb, and Nintendo realized this too, making Burst Bomb a returning sub-weapon for Mini Splatling kits in future games. Finally, we've made it to the second kit. This is the Zinc Mini Splatling, and is easily one of, if not the single best weapon in all of Splatoon, and maybe one of the best weapons ever across all three Splatoon games. Zimmy comes with Disruptor and Bubbler, which is probably the strongest and most game-breaking weapon kit that Splatoon has ever seen. This code becomes so infamous and powerful that the community would give it a name, calling the combination of Disruptor and Bubbler, Disrubbler, a pretty silly name that manages to strike fear into those who've experienced its sheer power. This thing is absolutely crazy, and it completely invalidates a large majority of Splatoon's weapons. So what makes this so insanely powerful when the other two mini Splatlings were relatively weak, and what made it so notable that it was given a name throughout the wider Splatoon community? Well, first of all, Disruptor is absolutely broken, and is the best sub in Splatoon 1 by a long shot. It consumes 50% of your tank to throw, and inflicts a debuff on anyone who gets hit by its explosion radius, which explodes instantly upon hitting anything, reducing run and swim speed by 45 and 65% respectively, increasing ink consumption rates, reducing ink recovery rates and jump height, and making any inflicted targets glow when swimming in ink. All of these insanely impactful debuffs activated instantly, and lasted for a whole 5 seconds, which is a crazy long time to be almost completely immobile in Splatoon. Mini being very fast, having a fast kill time, and outranging most shooters means it can just throw Disruptor and shoot whatever it's fighting from a safe distance, and there's not much you can really do about it, severely worsening around half of the game's top tiers. Well, what about the other weapons that outranged it and had tools to kill it, even while trapped in Disruptor? Well, the solution comes in its special, which is Bubbler. Bubbler is considered by most to be the second best special in Splatoon 1, right behind Kraken, but it works better than Kraken here when paired with Mini Splatling and Disruptor specifically. Bubbler activates instantly and protects you from any damage for almost 5 seconds, solving the issue of what to do when trying to Disruptor trap a weapon that outranges the Mini Splatling. The Bubbler stacks incredibly well with Disruptor not only because of this, but also because of the instant ink refill you get. And since Disruptor takes 50% of your tank to throw, you can throw two Disruptors, use Bubbler, and then throw two more Disruptors right after, all without having to run any sub-saver on your gear, which is absolutely absurd. Oh, and by the way, you can chain this Bubbler to your teammates by touching them, which also gives them full invincibility, so it's not just used for taking fights alone or disruptor trapping, but can also be used to help your teammates. As mentioned earlier, the other two minis couldn't really run any of the meta gear abilities because of dependency on run speed up. Zinc Mini, despite having the same reliance on run speed up as the other two, doesn't really have this problem because its absurd kit is plenty enough to make up for the lack of whatever gear ability was popular at the time. While Zimmy didn't care about running the abilities itself, that doesn't make it bad, and in fact makes it very, very good, because it wasn't limited by damage up, defense up, or quick respawn. It was just that good already. Not only has Zimmy been a top pick from the weapon's release, but it also played a major role in shifting Western Splatoon from their focus on damage up and defense up, to a much greater emphasis on quick respawn and invincibility specials, which is the state Splatoon 1 is in today. The event that shifted the metagame in the West was the defeat of Chimera, the best Western team, by a Japanese team called Almost Kids, who were using quick respawn strats in a big tournament. I talked about this match a little bit in the last video, but it's even more important to talk about here because Zinc Mini Splatling was a major part of their comp that revolutionized the way people played and thought about the game. These are the two comps that AK ran against Chimera, and as you can see, both of them feature Zinc Mini, and the Mahi Rainmaker comp, being one of Zinc Mini's best maps, features double Zinc Mini. This weapon is very important to AK win condition. By using the insane supportive potential of Zimmy with its bubbler output and disruptor spam, and combining that with the other weapons on the team specking into quick respawn, they can take advantage of the fact that their deaths with quick respawn aren't nearly as impactful on the game as Chimera's deaths without quick respawn. Since Chimera's players have a longer respawn timer on average, and with Zimmy making fights much safer and easier to take, AK was almost always up in manpower, and used this to their advantage by confidently winning 2-0, thanks to their almost constant presence and the scariness of getting punished by Zimmy. This is how Zinc Mini Splatling played a massive role in the paradigm shift of Splatoon 1, and just proves how impactful this weapon really was to the first game, as well as how people thought about Splatoon as a whole. Of course, the strategy that AK used isn't perfect, as it only really works when the other team isn't running Quick Respawn, and when they are, the whole idea falls apart. That's why this comp didn't work nearly as well after they literally changed the entire Splatoon scene with two matches. After Splatoon 1 shifted to what it is today, dominated by Quick Respawn, Zimmy began to fall off a little bit, as most no longer consider it to be the absolute best weapon in the game, but definitely at the top among three other insanely powerful weapons. 
The other three weapons at the top, being Custom Range Blaster, Cherry H3, and Slosher, all have tools to fight Zinc Mini, which is a big part of why they're often placed higher on top of already being insanely strong weapons. Over the course of Splatoon 1's lifespan, the minis would receive a few changes. They would receive special depletion numbers listed on screen now, which honestly didn't matter too much, but what did matter was a much more impactful change, being a significant buff to their charge times, going from 0.33 seconds to 0.3 seconds for the first charge, and 0.5 seconds to 0.45 seconds for the second charge. This might not seem like much, but the few frames this change shaved off can matter a lot, and they did, seeing as those changes were reverted quickly upon the release of Splatoon 2. Overall, the story of Splatoon 1 mini splatling is both really interesting and also sort of sad. Zinc Mini was just so much better than the other two mini splatlings to the point that only Zimmy ever saw success, leaving the other two relatively undocumented and frankly not cared about. It just goes to show that in a game with broken gear abilities that form the metagame, being dependent on abilities that aren't those is a massive disadvantage, which is why the other two mini splatlings were almost never seen, and Zimmy, with its broken kit, was seen significantly more. Sadly, this scenario of one weapon kit being so much more popular or better than the other is something that happens frequently in the Splatoon series, which will unfortunately happen again in the second game, Splatoon 2. Upon the release of Splatoon 2, Nintendo would attempt to balance the game better by nerfing some of the Splatoon 1 top tiers and buffing some of the underpowered weapons. Mini, being one of the most prominent and strong weapons in the last game, understandably got some nerfs. These nerfs mostly dealt with the weapon's painting ability, still keeping it strong but not quite as good as before, likely because Nintendo was afraid of its special output being too strong. Some other nerfs include reverting the charge time changes from Splatoon 1, decreasing its strafe speed while firing and while charging, and increasing its whiting frames a decent amount. The main redesign idea that was present in Splatoon 2 was a much larger focus on team play and coordination rather than individual skill. This was mainly seen in the complete overhaul of the special weapons, and with this overhaul, many would find its new favorite specials, which would help it play into its aggro support hybrid playstyle. Besides the direct nerfs to the weapon and the loss of one of the greatest kits Splatoon has ever seen, many, unlike a few other Splatoon 1 top tiers, mostly benefited from the new game, and it was definitely looking up for the weapon, especially considering its first kit. The first kit that the weapon would get is the vanilla mini splatling, equipped with a very strong burst bomb antenna missiles. Despite how powerful this kit sounds, and is, it would stay relatively untouched for a long time. It had burst bomb, a sub that synergizes very well with mini, and just these two parts of the kit were enough to make it pretty good but with the addition of Tena Missiles, this became the perfect mini splatling kit. However, it wasn't considered to be that great until later on, when Tena Missiles would be buffed and fixed, bringing them out from their previously bad and looked down upon state. They used to actually be pretty bad, but missiles were slowly getting better as the game developed, incrementally getting buffs like the ability to enter squid form with the special active, the targeting and missile number changes, and the multiple buffs to various parts of the special's frame data, which overall isn't too important to talk about in detail. Just know that the missiles were slowly getting better and slowly becoming more and more important to the game as it went on. Tena missiles weren't the only thing getting buffs though, as Nintendo had also been slowly buffing mini splatling itself, eventually bringing the main weapon to a better spot than it was at in Splatoon 1. Mini actually got a lot of buffs in this game, and most of these buffs were really impactful for the weapon. Two big nerfs from the start of the game were reverted, being the movement speed and widening frame nerfs, greatly increasing its mobility and decreasing its downtime. A few other really great buffs were given to it as well, such as changing the effectiveness curve of run speed up from 30 to 40% effectiveness, which was amazing for it, and even straight up increasing its damage per shot from 28 to 32. The damage and run speed up buffs were really good, as now Mini was a little less reliant on run speed up, giving it more gear flexibility, and the damage buff was especially helpful for dealing with ink armor, which takes a maximum of 30 damage to break, meaning that Mini now had a better chance against armored players, as it could kill them just that little bit faster. However, none of these buffs were nearly as good as the ones found in update 4.5.0. Mini Splatling would get some buffs to its movement speed while firing and while charging, but the main buff that now sets it apart from the other Splatlings is the increase to its jump height while holding a full charge, which is still present in the game today. The reason this buff is so impactful is that if you want to get your maximum jump height back as a Splatling, you have to drop your charge. Mini, on the other hand, gets its full jump height when holding its charge thanks to a jump height buff, allowing it to not only make jumps that other Splatlings couldn't, but allowing it to hold its charge when performing these jumps, giving it a leg up on every other Splatling except for Ballpoint because Ballpoint can do the same thing. Obviously this buff is insane and is exactly what pushed V-Mini into the meta. Outside of these buffs though, the weapon was already pretty dumb, being a 190B missile weapon. Mini's insane special spamming capabilities meant that it was easily able to output the most missiles out of any weapon at the time. 
often hitting the double digits in special count, which led to it seeing a lot of use everywhere. Looking at any high-level competitive Splatoon footage from anywhere in the world between updates 4.5.0 and 4.8.0, so around 2-3 months time, V-Mini was seen on like 90% of teams, and a lot of teams would run different weapons, making Mini very flexible and easy to fit wherever you want it. This made V-Mini the most popular and likely the best weapon in Splatoon 2 at the time, and it pretty much became a necessity to run it on any team if you wanted results, showing a lot of similarities to the Splash-O-Matic in Splatoon 3. Mini wouldn't stay on top forever though, as in Update 4.7.0, its points for special was nerfed from 190p to 210, and in 4.8.0, its ink consumption on a full charge was increased from 15 to 17.25%, officially pushing it out of the meta. After this, other missile weapons would become the staples of Splatoon 2's meta, and many would no longer be at that top spot. Unlike many other weapons that are super strong and fall off from the top spot, however, many stayed good. It's no longer meta-defining, but still really strong, and considered by many to be not only a top tier, but the best splatling in Splatoon 2, beating out other crazy strong options like Ballpoint Nouveau and Nautilus 79. This goes to show just how perfect this kit is for mini splatling, and just how insane buffing its jump height was. Unfortunately, just because a weapon is good doesn't mean it's the best at what it does, and Kenza Splattershot basically stepped in to take Mini's place right after it began to fall off. With a suction bomb and 180p missiles for whatever reason, K-Shot was basically set up to replace Mini, as in the same patch that Mini Splatling's points for special was reduced from 190 to 210, Suction Bomb received its damage buff, making it now deal 220, and Last Ditch Effort received its massive buff, turning it into the gear ability we know it as today. While K-Shot benefited heavily from this patch, which was 4.7.0 by the way, Mini didn't benefit at all, as even Last Ditch Effort was pretty much useless on it thanks to the need for run speed up. By the way, remember Area Cup, that really stacked JP tournament that I showed footage of just a little bit ago? Well, it turns out that Bowcut Nation, yes, this Bowcut Nation, was the first Western Splatoon team to ever make it to Grand Finals in that tournament, and they used many Splatling in their comps. If you don't know what Bowcut Nation was, they essentially ran meme comps every game they played, and they even ran double Splatling double Junior in an Area Cup, and it worked better than any other Western team before them, which I think is hilarious. The fact that a team centered around silly comps did this well in one of the hardest tournaments out there, and did it with this masterpiece of a comp, is crazy. And it also means that Splatoon 2 Mini Splatling has a really important tournament result, so it's sort of important to this video. You may have noticed that I haven't mentioned the other two Mini Splatlings at all, and while they were affected by the gear effectiveness changes and the reverted nerfs, meaning their main weapon was still good, as I mentioned before, it's all about kit synergy for the Mini Splatling. The other two kits were locked out of Burst Bomb, and there's not many possible kits that can beat Burst Bomb antenna missiles, so the other two saw significantly less use even when Mini Splatling was defining the meta. The second kit that Mini got was the Zinc Mini Splatling, equipped with Curling Bomb and Ink Storm. While this isn't necessarily a bad kit, especially when considering the weapon had 180p Ink Storm, which means it can get special really fast, it wasn't all too great. Mini is fine with curling, as it doesn't mind the extra movement abilities, but curling takes up 70% of your tank, a problem I mentioned before with Splatoon 1's V-Mini, which had Suction Bomb. Most of the time, you're following the curling bomb, and you're recharging your ink while following it, so it's not that big of a deal. Outside of this, Mini was also pretty hard outclassed by better and more popular rain weapons such as Tri Nouveau, Ballpoint Nouveau, and CDS. Because of this, it was almost never worth running, but did see some specific usage cases while V-Mini was a top tier because Ink Storm works better on a few maps than Missiles does, most notably Kelp Dome, although picking Zinc Mini at this time was mostly just because of personal preference or people overhyping Mini Splatling after the buffs. Overall not a very notable weapon, and there's not much to be said outside of that. The last of the three kits was the Kenza Mini Splatling, receiving Toxic Mist and Ultra Stamp, and while this kit sounds pretty awful, it wasn't entirely bad and still saw some use for a while after it was released. Giving the weapon Toxic Mist was an obvious callback to when it had Disruptor, and unfortunately for Kimmy, Toxic Mist is significantly worse than Disruptor was. Yeah, looking at all the Kenza kits, especially in Collection 4, the drop that Kimmy is part of, which also contains K-Gluga, K-Rapid, and K-Gal, which are some really, really good weapons, Toxic Mist and Ultra Stamp on the K-Mini is incredibly disappointing, considered by many to be the most disappointing Kenza kit of all of them. Toxic Mist pretty much does nothing for the weapon, as it only really slows the opponent down, and definitely does not do nearly as good of a job at that as Disruptor did. Mini in this game also definitely prefers a bomb over a mist, as it sort of struggles without that extra damage, which is the main reason why most K-Mini players don't use their Toxic Mist very much, especially when investing into full aggro, 
as it essentially becomes a waste of ink. Ultra Stamp, however, was the thing that made this weapon stand out. Mini Splatling doesn't necessarily synergize too well with Ultra Stamp, as it struggles to keep up the aggression that Ultra Stamp enables. However, this weapon is still pretty good, mostly due to Mini Splatling's raw stamp output. Mini, like almost every other Ultra Stamp weapon, was 180p, and since none of the stamp weapons can charge special nearly as fast as Mini, and the main weapon was really good, it had a strong niche with Ultra Stamp for a while, and was even used a significant amount in higher levels of play. While this usage was mostly due to the fact that the main weapon was really, really good, this was also pretty much the best stamp weapon at the time, since Tenno Camobrella had not been released yet. Since it had Ultra Stamp, Kimmy couldn't really lean into the supportive side of Mini Splatling very much, despite having a generally support-oriented sub-weapon in Toxic Mist. Thanks to Toxic Mist, though, it could play into the part of support weapons that is usually forgotten about, which is directly helping its teammates. You can see this in the opening of Port Mackerel Zones in a high-level JP tournament. Both teams are running a mini Splatling, but one team is running a V-mini, whereas the other is running a K-mini. Both Splatlings open the same way, taking the left middle route, but the V-mini hangs back and paints their court, while the K-mini goes straight for mid to cap zone. The K-mini here knows that it doesn't get nearly as much value out of its Ultra Stamp right now, as V-mini gets out of its missiles on opening, so K-mini's best option is to help its teammates take the zone. Later on in the match, you can see the V-mini constantly focused on painting and getting missiles up to help support its teammates, while the K-Mini is busy directly helping its teammates take fights. As you can see, K-Mini has a lot less freedom than V-Mini due to needing to be present with its special, and V-Mini isn't as restricted because it can use missiles wherever it wants and still be effective along with having Burst Bomb, another source of damage. That is the main reason V-Mini is so good, and as it goes, so much better than the other two kits. Well that's pretty much the end of Mini Splatling in Splatoon 2. Not too surprisingly, almost every Mini player left the weapon after the hype surrounding it died down, leaving it mostly for other weapons like Nautilus 79, Ballpoint Nouveau, and Kenza Splattershot. Outside of a very small amount of people who wanted Ultra Stamp, needed lots of paint in their comp, and didn't play Tent, there was pretty much no usage for Kenza Mini either, and nobody played Zinc Mini, it was not a good weapon. Vanilla Mini Splatling is a rare case in Splatoon, as it's an extremely solid weapon with pretty much nobody who plays it in competitive to back up the claim that it's as good as people say it is. Outside the 2 month period where Mini was the best weapon in the game, I had a lot of trouble finding Mini Splatling gameplay in Splatoon 2, and that mainly comes down to the fact that Mini is not an easy weapon to play, and it's especially difficult to push it to the point where it can work at the highest level of the game when it doesn't have an insane kit to back it up. Mini Splatling, while not being used very much at all in the favor of the other high tier Splatlings, was still pretty great, and while both of the viable kits began to fall off after the game descended into being pretty much dominated by the shooter class, it would still be remembered for what it once was, and will retain its place as a top tier alongside other once meta-defining monsters like tri and Bamboo Mark 1. Upon the release of Splatoon 3, not much really changed with Mini Splatling except its kit. It didn't receive any buffs or nerfs upon release, but it did get a big buff in version 3.1.0, increasing its firing duration by roughly 17% making it go from 1.2 to around 1.5 seconds of firing time. This buff was really good for Mini, and it definitely bumped it up quite a bit, but of course, we can't talk about how good the weapon is without talking about the kits. Vanilla Mini is introduced in Splatoon 3 with the kit of Burst Bomb and Ultra Stamp. We already know how good Burst Bomb is for Mini, and we already know how mediocre Ultra Stamp is for it, so while combining those two definitely doesn't make a top tier kit, it's still very worth talking about. As usual, Mini's special output is wild, and it gets its Ultra Stamp faster than any other weapon in the game right now, which is really great, especially after looking at the fact that it has Burst Bomb, allowing it to position more aggressively and get more value out of its Ultra Stamp. On top of this, Stamp functions a whole lot better in Splatoon 3 due to hitbox changes, need for object damage, and a myriad of buffs that help it a lot. Even though it has higher special output, Mini is just hard outclassed by Vanilla Splatana Wiper for a multitude of reasons. Splatana Wiper is a crazy good main weapon that is extremely mobile, and synergizes with Ultra Stamp better than a vast majority of weapons in the game. Combine this with its stupidly high object damage and great synergy with Torpedo, and Mini pretty much doesn't stand a chance. Sure, the paint output and special output is greater overall than Wiper, but those strengths aren't nearly as important as the one Wiper brings to the table, leading V-Mini to see virtually no use at all, which is really unfortunate for the weapon. While V-Mini was a weapon that people at least considered before Wiper rose to being one of the best weapons in the game, Zinc Mini had it a whole lot worse. Equipped with the honestly really bad kit of Toxic Mist and Big Bubbler, being an obvious callback to Zimmy from Splatoon 1, this thing is pretty garbage. We already talked about Toxic Mist being sorta bad for the weapon, so not much needs to be said. 
On the other hand, Big Bubbler seems good in theory, like it does with most weapons that have it, but Bubble is hard countered by almost every other special in the game, vastly unlike its dominant Splatoon 1 counterpart. With Bubbler being entirely based on object damage, and Splatoon 3 having so many things that deal crazy object damage, it's usually not useful outside of being an ink refill, basically leaving Zimmy without a special. But that's not even really the main problem with this special on Zimmy. Unlike Kenzamini, which had other means of dealing damage to compensate for having Toxic Mist, Splatoon 3 Zimmy does not have any damage dealing options outside of the main weapon, forcing it to rely a lot heavier on its support oriented kit than it should have to, especially when that support oriented kit isn't even that good in the first place. On top of that, just like the V Mini, this thing is straight up outclassed by other weapons. Splattershot Jr., Squiffer, and even the newly released H3D are all better than this thing for multiple reasons. And if you're about to defend Zimmy by saying its special output must be better, Zimmy is 200p and Splattershot Jr. is 180p for whatever reason, and Splattershot Jr. also has a lethal bomb, so Zimmy doesn't even stand a chance. I can potentially see a use for Zimmy in this new season, with Big Bubbler not taking nearly as much damage from Tena Missiles, and Wiper Deco likely being very popular, but again, just use Junior or H3D. Unfortunately, Mini has not gotten its third kit yet, and probably won't for a long while, so there isn't any more to talk about on the kit side of the weapon. So far, it's looking pretty bad for Mini's Splatling in Splatoon 3, with the first kit having Mini's best sub and still being completely outclassed, alongside the second kit being just really bad right now, we can pretty safely say that the chances for getting a good Mini Splatling as the third kit are slim. If Nintendo wants to give us a good kit for the weapon, my best suggestion at this point is probably Fizzy Bomb and Ink Storm, but I'm not sure Nintendo sees the full potential of Fizzy on Mini Splatling, and I can pretty much assure you that after the terrible performance of Zimmy in Splatoon 2, they won't think very highly of Ink Storm on the weapon either. I will say that while not being nearly as good as some of its predecessors, Mini is still a very fun weapon in Splatoon 3. I don't really play the weapon myself, but I played a good amount of it as research for this video, and the sheer amount of paint and special output is something I'm not used to at all, being a blaster player. It's very refreshing and honestly exciting going from painting 700 a game to 1300, and the V-Mini kit is super fun despite Wiper being so much better. I really like the Mini Splatling, despite its gear dependency and kit synergy centric flaws, and if you want, I highly suggest trying it out if you haven't already. While the future doesn't look great for the weapon, it's still something that deserves a lot more love than it gets, and it's been sort of put aside and forgotten about in Splatoon 3, despite how impactful it was on the previous games. I'm not saying it should be used over Wiper or H3D, but I am saying I think the weapon is really cool, and to me, even as someone that cares about planning and playing optimally, cool points matter a lot. By the way, if this is your first time here, I've linked a playlist in the description that contains the rest of my weapon history videos in case you liked this one and want to see more. That's it from me though, I hope you enjoyed this iteration of my Splatoon weapon history series, and I'll be happy to pump out more whenever I get the time. Meanwhile, I'm working on fixing my setup, so you'll likely be seeing me play the game a lot more, especially with this new season introducing some really cool new weapons. I hope you all have a great rest of your day, and I'll see you in the next video.